Good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Wessel, director of the Hutchins Center at Brookings on behalf of my colleagues here and at Washington University at Brandeis and at uh, University of Chicago. I wanna welcome you to the final session, but not by any means the least important session of our uh, annual municipal finance conference. Uh, we're gonna to talk today about the outlook for state and local infrastructure spending. I think it's well known to everybody in this group that uh, state and local governments own much and do of the infrastructure, physical infrastructure in the United States and do much of the infrastructure investment. And I think that the best data I've looked at suggests that um, the, the uh, trend before the pandemic was for as a share of GDP, both federal, state, and local infrastructure spending had been on a downward trend. Um, of course, there's been substantial political appetite to reverse that, most notably in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, um, that uh, allocated, uh, would increase federal spending on infrastructure, physical infrastructure above the baseline by about $550 billion over the next decade. And there's money in this bill from bro for broadband, transportation, water, and a host of other things. I want to note that um, uh, we here at, at Brookings uh, do not want to suggest that investing in human in uh, capital is unimportant. We think that investments, is particularly in children, is crucial to our future economic growth. But for today's discussion, we're going to focus mainly on physical infrastructure. And I think we have some conflicting forces. On one hand, there is all this federal money, if they can get it out of Washington and into the hands of state and local governments so it can be spent. State and local governments are in fairly good shape as a whole, um, but we are now seeing rising interest rates, which of course, of course make it more expensive for state and local governments to borrow to pursue federal, to pursue, pursue infrastructure spending. So we have actually a great plan today. We've tried to get several different perspectives. Uh, let me introduce them in alphabetical order. Uh, Ryan Burney is a senior advisor to Mitch Landrew, the infrastructure implementation coordinator in the White House. He previously worked for Landrew in the city government in New Orleans. And before that, he worked for James Carville, which I think could probably be a 45 minute session in and of itself. Um, DJ Gribben's uh, resume is so long that if I read it all, it would take all 45 minutes. He's had a number of roles in the public and private sector. Most relevant for this conversation, he was a special assistant to President Trump for infrastructure in 2017 and 18, and previously was general counsel at the Department of Transportation, the federal one, and a chief counsel at the Federal Highway Administration. He's also worked in the private sector for quite a while for Macquarie Group, and is now its Stone Speak Infrastructure Partners and at his own firm called Madras. Uh, Shushana Liu has been executive director of the Colorado Department of Transportation since December 2018. Previously, she was at the Rhode Island Department of Transportation, but she's also been at the U.S. Department of Transportation and at the Office of Management and Budget and the Domestic Policy Council in the White House. And Eden Perry is the head of the U.S. Public Finance uh, Operation at S&P Global Ratings. Unlike everybody else on this call, she hasn't changed jobs very much. She's been at um, S&P for more than 20 years. Um, so with that, we're going to go right into the discussion. If anybody has questions, as we've said before, you can go to the website Slido, S-L-I.D-O, hashtag MuniFinance, and put your questions in there, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, Ryan tells me he's joining from by phone, but uh, I think that should work. Um, I thought I'd start with you, Eden Perry, if I might. Um, so compared to say the pre-pandemic years and the pandemic years of 20, uh, 2021, what do you see ahead for local and state infrastructure spending in terms of volume types and how responsive is in the current environment, especially given rising interest rates, the muni bond market to funding infrastructure projects? Thank you, David. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, my first time being at Brookings, so I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so what we're seeing so far, uh, I think I was on a prior panel and I heard someone say this, this has been a pretty rough year for the municipal bond market in terms of volume. Um, and we're down significantly from the last two years, but they were very strong volume years. This year, we're seeing a real drop off in the volume in the municipal market. 
but that's actually because we had really strong years in terms of refunding activity. And this year, we're actually seeing um, the market being driven by new activity, by uh, new issuance. So this year, new issuance as of May was up to was up at uh, 139 billion, and that was more than 10 billion from the last year and 20 billion the two prior years. So we are actually seeing a lot of new activity in the municipal bond, bond market, and that's not surprising given given what you already alluded to the um, Inve infrastructure investment and job act. So uh, the biggest growth that we saw so far this year is in the utility sector, whereas the other sectors primarily have been down a bit. Um, what we're expecting is continued growth actually in terms of new issuance. It might not be actually new issuance in capital spending. A lot of it will probably be pay as you go capital spending. And um, it shouldn't be surprising given the level of infrastructure projects that are still needed across the country the um, the invest the IIJA and also the American Rescue Plan Act, and then also the still relatively low um, interest rate environment. And I think a lot of issuers are still wanting to get into the debt market prior to the interest rates rising. However, we noted in a recent report that we just released earlier this month called "Increase in U.S. State Debt Levels in 2021 Was a Blip," published earlier this month. Total debt date increased by four percent in 2021. And that's actually a real departure from prior tr trends. And it's not something that we expect to continue due to the influx, flux, influx of federal aid across states, which has increased the push to fund capital projects on a pay-as-you-go basis. According to NASBO, states increased capital spending on infrastructure by 9.1% in fiscal 2021. And that was the strongest growth in 15 years, but 72% of that was pay-as-you-go funding. And we expect this level to remain high over the next several years, given the federal aid funding that states and local governments received. Mm -hmm. D discussing that, uh, the tr trillion dollar dollars in the in Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, Act we're expecting that to, to, to fund primarily traditional infrastructure needs across the states, roads, bridges, airports, transit, rail. But the bill also targeted, targeted risk related to resiliency, energy transition, electric charging stations and cybersecurity. But the largest portion, 284 billion was for transportation, which is something that we see often in the, in the municipal bond sector and is always well received. Um, in terms of resiliency, we're expecting the focus to be on improved power grid effectiveness, reduce wildfire fire risk, and to ensure Western water availability. The existing program certainty will also fund, we saw the fund setting for five years of highway trust fund, Drinking water and clean water state revolving funds. And then, then there was $1.25 billion for cybersecurity. But in terms of what you were talking in your introduction, going forward, we expect to see depends on a few factors, which should be sur not surprising to anyone here on the panel what happens with inflation, supply side disruption, the difficulty finding workers for projects, the increased wages for workers. And what we're expecting because of this is we're expecting that states and local governments may be changing the scopes of projects focusing on smaller, more impactful projects, or even some states and local governments are stretching out the timing if possible. And last, I've, we've been hearing some discussion of trying to get the federal reimbursement for some of these project costs. Um, all of the projects that we've discussed would be well-received with the municipal market. These are projects that are really the staple and the bread and, bubble, bread and butter of the public finance community. There was a a report issued about a year ago from our chief economist, Beth Ann Bavino, the report was titled How U.S. Infrastructure Investment Would Boost Jobs, Productivity, and the Economy. And a few takeaways from that piece is that a trillion dollar investment like the IIJA would add $1.4 trillion to the economy over an eight year period or a fiscal multiplier of 1.4 times. And the private sector productivity would boost be boosted around 10 basis points on average per year. And in terms of job creation, it would be over 883,000 jobs, mainly in the middle class, and per capita income would increase by 10.5% with this type of investment. And these types of outcomes are always welcome the municipal market. The municipal community likes stability and they like economic growth. I just want to clarify one thing. When you say pay as you go, you mean instead of borrowing, they use current revenues to pay Exactly. For exactly. Yeah, that's a term we use often. Yeah, market. just want to clarify. So Shoshana, I know we can't see you, but I understand you can hear us and we can hear you. Is that right? You're on mute, so I can't. Sorry, mute. there are folks trying to fix my video, uh, but yes, can you hear me? We can hear you loud. Me okay? So how does the world look from California, uh, from Colorado? Are you flooded with federal money? What are you spending it on? And when you look ahead for the next couple of years, what are the 
issues that worry you? Oh, uh, I, I would I would say the view from Colorado is uh, superior to the other seas. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's a mix, right? And you know, in Colorado, we're lucky to have a policy environment where our state legislature and governor work together on a funding package that actually preceded the federal package. So we are dealing, you know, with a confluence of the work that we did a year prior to the federal bill with the additional resources that came um, following following that and those coming together in a way that is uh, is allowing us to pay for a lot more than we would have before. You know, the, the uh, slightly tempered upside to, uh, and downside is that the formula funding from the federal um, allocation is significant, but it doesn't change our annual uh, amount by an order of magnitude. You know, it gives us roughly, you know, on average, say we get an extra year to year and a half worth of funding over the five-year period of the bill, which is a lot, but it's not enough to uh, kind of wholly change the order of magnitude of the program. Um, when you combine that with what we did for ourselves first uh, through the state package, it's enough to really get our capital plan done if we stay disciplined. So, you know, the view is a good one, but it's also one where we have to manage expectations because if we don't stay focused on building the plan we have, that amount of money could dissipate quickly. So the, you know, what we're doing is we quickly plugged the resources in um, to the plan that we had been developing for a matter of years and are just kind of going through it in an orderly fashion and you know, trying to make sure that the public can see the results of what we do. You know, of course, the economy right now you know, means that there's some variability in the pricing of projects and sort of figuring out what can come in relatively close to the original budget is another uh, vector of this exercise. But you know, it's 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 a lot of the accountability and project management work of making sure that we um, are clear about where dollars are going, how much is available for projects, and we build scope to the dollars we have. And are you getting enough guidance from Washington on the discretionary part of the IIJA? Um, there are an awful lot of federal uh, discretionary programs now. Um, some of them are new. Some of them are variants of ones that have been uh, around for several years. And you know, I think by and large what we are trying to do is figure out how to um, write a finite number of good applications and focus what we're applying for, again, on getting our sort of holistic vision done. You know, I think there's um, the, the uh, our federal friends have a hard uh, set of challenges on their plate delivering all of these new programs. You know, I would applaud DOT for trying to combine the sources where they can. You know, they put out a single funding notice in one instance for three different programs so that instead of having to apply three times, we could do it once. You know, the more they can do that, the easier it is for people where we sit to actually avail ourselves of those programs. Um, you know, I think on the back end, how they project manage those could be challenging if it's not very organized because um, the dollars will flow through different operating administrations with different rules. So making sure that you know, they're as, as adherent to consolidation on the back end as they've been on the front end, I think will be important. But uh, considering the magnitude of new programs, they're getting those out quickly and uh, we're applying for them. Hmm. Thanks. So Ryan, tell us what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong in the administration. <laughs> well, for once we actually uh, have money to, to dole out to states and cities. Um, uh, it, it wasn't that long ago when I was deputy mayor in New Orleans dealing with DJ and we we're talking about a lot of P3 opportunities, but not a lot of real money. And, and now we have this once in a generation opportunity to really push uh, into cities and states, primarily 90% of the funding is going to be spent by states and cities. Um, very little of the money is, is spent by uh, you know, the federal government and, and direct spend. Um, we've really been focused on just getting organized to set up everyone for success. We view this as a five to seven year uh, endeavor. And in many instances, the money will be spent 10 and 12 years out, um, given, given the way that things work. Um, we have uh, really started to build a team at the White House to focus on project delivery, focus on uh, setting up the right structures. We've Each state has appointed a state infrastructure coordinator at our direction um, with one or two exceptions. Um, and we're working really hard on making sure that low capacity communities have the resources needed to both plan for and uh, apply for funding. The bill um, that Shoshana just referenced and, and she knows better than most is 375 programs 125 of them are brand new um, yeah. and most of those are competitive and just the process of setting up those the mechanisms the staff i mean one of the biggest things we're doing 
is hiring federal agency staff to be able to process paperwork and reviews and, and to write all the front end. I mean, the, the Department of Energy went from a primarily research and development based organization to now having $60 billion to spend on clean energy infrastructure um, and overnight. So they've had to create an entire new undersecretariat, a new undersecretary, whole new uh, offices. Um, and so a lot of our early efforts been spent there. We've pushed out $110 billion to date in announcements. Um, the obligations and outlays follow uh, in order. Um, we've rolled out a lot of the major programs that are formula-based that uh, are a lot of existing programs that maybe have some tweaks and changes, maybe a new climate lens, maybe a new equity lens, but primarily primarily existing funds. And then we're moving now into rolling out a lot of these clean energy programs, grid resilience programs um, to be coming this summer. And then we're, we're now making awards. So uh, uh, two weeks ago, we announced a billion dollars of uh, grants to airports for airport terminals. The first time the federal government has invested in terminals themselves, typically the federal investments in runways and, uh, you know, uh, control towers and stuff like that. Um, in a few weeks, we'll have uh, announcements for the RAISE program, which is one of the most popular uh, transportation programs that's competitive for, for cities. And so, you know, we really feel like we've hit the ground running. We've got a good process in place, we've got a good team and structure set up. Uh, and as Shoshana can attest, because uh, we had a call with her on Friday, we're also really focused on like, how do we actually build things again in this country? Um, and, and maybe not even act like we ever got it right in the first place. How do we actually reconstruct the process to be able to make the system work better so that, um, you know, this, this doesn't have to be just a once in a generation opportunity. We, we can prove and be successful and hopefully Congress will act um, to continue to give us money in the future. That, that's a, you raise a good point. I once heard a, um, a, a trademark Rahm Emanuel rant about how hard it was. I think DJ was at that event, actually, how hard it was to get anything built in Chicago and pleading with Washington to help basically override uh, a lot of local and state uh, rules in order to just get things done. Have you thought at all about why it takes so long to build things in the US and how expensive it is and what we might do at the federal level to, to streamline yeah. the process? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, there are a lot of different inputs there. Um, I would say a lot of folks get focused and, and sometimes stuck on the permitting piece, but we, we have released a permitting action plan. We are doing all the kind of best practice things of coordination, public timelines, full transparency to really, really lean in on that piece. But there, you know, there's contracting math methodologies. There's just litigation risk here. Um, there's, you know, the more community engagement you have on the front end, the better it is on the back end. I mean, there, there are a lot of things. So one of the things we're actually going to do this fall is uh, host a kind of project delivery summit of best practices, kind of lift up. Here are some good examples of projects that have really worked well um, and how we, you know, deliver them. M Mitch's mantra is on time, on task, under budget. Um, any one of those things would be pretty hard to do. Um, and we're trying to do all three. Um, but, you know, that is our, that's our goal. And so we are really, um, it kind of gets driven and beat into everybody's heads day in and day out. And we're working with states. I mean, as you mentioned, a lot of this is uh, not just federal regulations and rules. A lot of it happens with the layering of uh, federal, uh, state and local. Um, and so we're working up and down the stream. We worked with the state of Michigan, for example, on its own permitting action plan to kind of mirror some of the things that we're doing uh, here and, and at the federal government level. Thanks. So DJ, I remember talking to you when you were in the White House and I think you said your job was to explain, the president wanted you to figure out a way to, if he gave you a nickel on infrastructure, you should turn it into 25 cents. Um, you didn't have the advantage that Ryan has that Congress actually put some money into this. Right. So I basically have two questions with you. One is, given all the things we've just talked about with Ryan, how do you think this administration is doing? And then secondly, to what extent do you think we'll stop, we'll do more than talk about public-private partnerships in this space? David, those are, are two really good questions. And I'll, I'll start with the first one, how the administration is doing. And Ryan, I will save some rebuttal time for you at the end of my comments in case you want to come back <laughs> and disagree with whatever I just have to say. Um, I'm going to split up the analysis into two parts, politics and policy, in terms of how the administration is doing. 
um, on the politics side, give an A. Like they're doing a phenomenal job. As Ryan mentioned, they're talking about we passed the bill with money in, then we're making the money available. Now we've got a NOFO. Now we're taking formula funds and applying to this project. They've done a phenomenal job in kind of building public's confidence that this money that's been invested in infrastructure is actually being deployed and moving and moving well. I'd also give the administration points uh, for bringing Mitch Landry and Ryan on board. I mean, there, there is a world of difference, and Shoshana knows this as well, from being a federal policy person and being a recipient on the sort of the receiving ends of those policies and uh, having a team with their experience and other people's experience along those lines, very, very helpful. Um, communicating, I think they're using Secretary of Edge really well. As, you know, so it's important as everyone can appreciate to not only have a nice law, but also to go out and make sure the public understands what you are doing with that. And I think in terms of communicating to the public and communicating with potential grant recipients at the state and local level, administration is doing a fabulous job. Um, uh, the second part in addition to politics, we're talking about policy. And while uh, you know, getting a bill passed, kudos administration getting the bill passed, obviously something we weren't able to do. That bill is a hot mess. And I think Ryan is being polite. Um, David, you mentioned in your book about opportunity zones, how if you have an idea that's really innovative and creative, but you sort of toss it into a big piece of legislation at the very end of the process, it doesn't work well. Now, remember where this bill came from, right? This is like two handfuls of senators that got together, uh, you know, almost like got together over beers and threw a bunch of stuff that was on the shelf into a bill, sent it to the House. The House did nothing with it, passed it. And now we've got 135 new grant programs. Uh, and as Ryan touched on, my gosh, we tried to do one program, the Urban Partnership Agreement in the Bush administration. And that was incredibly difficult. Uh, this bill has a competitive program for culverts. And I don't know who the head of the culvert lobby is that got this in there, but that person should get a huge bonus. For those who know what culvert is, a pipe that goes underneath a road or a railroad to just channel water away from the infrastructure. There's now a new federal competitive grant program for culverts. Um, so there's going to be lots of programs, lots of money, lots of chaos. I would also differ a little bit with Ryan on the uh, permitting action plan the administration had. And Ryan, I am one of those people that fixates a little bit on the permitting process because again, all the jobs, all the economic developments, all of the, you know, the social equity we're looking for and all that, none of that happens unless the money's actually spent on a project and you can't spend any money until you're permitted. And the permitting action plan creates eight new uh, intergovernmental agencies has 10 new sort of guidance regulatory requirements, including new regulation, and has eight new reporting requirements for every agency to have. And this seems to be almost like a faith-based approach to permitting, where we're going to have a plan and we're going to want it to go faster, but they're going to create lots of layers of activity, which in my experience in government never makes anything go faster. So it's, it's good and then it creates lots of communications but every one of those communications takes time, takes effort. And my gosh, we have a, like the world's slowest permitting plan among developed countries already. Do we really need it to be any slower? Um, one thing that's a little counterintuitive when it comes to infrastructure is you think getting communities more involved is always a good thing. And, and usually it is, but one of the things I worry about is all of this communication and money going directly to communities. It could end up taking the NIMBY program which is you know, not in my backyard where no one wants infrastructure in the backyard, and create a new NIMBY, and they're not creating a new NIMC program, which is like not my community, where we're handing communities vetoes over you know, critical roads or transmission or whatever long linear infrastructure we're trying to build. So I'll, I'll wrap up by saying, I think phenomenal job on the politics side. On the policy side, they've been handed a disaster of a bill um, they're applying lots of new regulations and new sort of systems in place that almost as surely will slow it down. And I was really comforted to hear Ryan saying, like, money's not going to be spent for, uh, you know, seven, ten years. I'm actually more optimistic than that. I think it will be spent sooner than that, but it's going to be five, six, seven years. And that's going to bump into the public perception that this bill has passed, money's available, now our infrastructure problems will be solved. Mute. 
stop you there and get to the public private partnership in a minute. So Ryan, I don't want to hear your commentary on what the Congress did because I don't think you'd be tell us the truth anyways, but do you want to respond to DJ's comments about how you've administered the thing? And Well, I don't, I mean, I don't think he was even really making a comment about how we administered. I mean, I think, look, we have gotten $110 billion announced that money is going out to spend uh, on projects. We are breaking ground on projects that are going to the ground. Um, one of the, uh, one of the positive things I think about the structure of the bill, particularly in the formula funding, is that they did sp spread out money over five-year increments. And so that is why you will have, um, if people are not getting money five years, five fiscal years out, which is if six years out, um, and they're planning for it, that those projects take you know two to three, five years, depending on what it is, uh, which of course we have to make, make work better. You know, that's how you get to the 10 years out mark. Um, I will say, you know, there's not an area of the bill. Um, it is it is a lot. Uh, I don't think anybody would uh, dispute uh, that it's a lot. I mean, they're kind of kind of 12 core areas, but with 375 programs, you got a lot in it. Um, but these are these are areas that have been significantly underinvested in for centuries. I mean, our infrastructure is not just our roads and bridges. Um, it is our water systems that are failing. It is the high speed internet that is like critical to everything we do and. Uh, the world today um, and, and don't have to sit through the last two years, two and a half years to know that. Um, and so, you know, cleaning up the legacy pollution, investing in clean energy, those, that is really the crux of what the, the bill does. Um, and so, you know, those programs all fit into those kind of those loose buckets. Um, this, so I, that, that would be my only, my only point. And, and look on the permitting action plan, um, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of agreement about the types of things that work. Um, and we're, we're really committed to just making sure that it's a priority. It's one of the first things we rolled out, uh, two, two things. One was working with inspectors general, um, and the GAO to make sure there was no waste, fraud, abuse. And the second thing was, uh, developing a permitting action plan because we have to be able to build things better and faster in this country. It's just, that's a that's a fact, and you don't have to be a Republican or Democrat to agree with that statement. So, so Shoshana, can you pick up on that? How do you handle uh, permitting in Colorado? How do you deal with the nimbyism and the fact that our system makes it so easy for someone who doesn't like a project to litigate it? I mean, in in my own backyard in Washington, there's just examples, one example after another, of things that get drawn out, including a, a new metro line, just by by just endless litigation by people who seem to have endless amounts of money to spend on lawyers? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting and longstanding question where you can uh, kind of ar argue it a few different ways with different projects. I mean, just to kind of um, set the framework, what we call permitting is really probably a consolidation of hundreds of different decisions, right? I mean, it's everything from implementation of the Clean Air Act and the National Environmental Policy Act to you know, by America and Davis Bacon to local um, authorities that bring to bear even on projects at other levels of government sometimes. You know, here, some of the municipalities will sometimes invoke a rule that gives them sort of a permitting uh, process in our projects. And the landscape differs in different places. And, you know, there are pros and cons to each of these processes like there are to everything. You know, my, my view is that sometimes the National Environmental Policy Act gets a bad rap on projects. Um, and that if you're strategic about how you implement it, it can actually help to solve problems rather than create them. I mean, to use an example, and this is one that DJ knows well, you know, we have a project that's coming to closure in Denver now. Um, the, the segment of Interstate 70 that uh, goes through the city where it was uh, deliberated upon for about a decade before it actually got a shovel in the ground. You know, on the face of it, you could say, darn it, the permitting process took too long. If you dig beneath the surface on that project, part of what happened is that the agency that I now run um, you know, really pushed back on taking community concerns seriously. When everybody finally got to the table and dealt with what were real concerns about the what it would do to the fabric of the neighborhood seriously, they were able to reach a resolution and the execution of the project has actually um, gone off pretty smoothly since it got under construction. You know, what we learned from that was that we actually needed to change the way the process works to make us do more at the beginning so that you work through that stuff, you know, in year one, not in year nine, right? I mean, if you're going to end up doing 
things like air quality monitoring, which is actually a best practice um, to understand the implications of a project, do it at the beginning and don't argue about it for eight years. You know, that doesn't solve everything. I, I don't think that would have fixed the purple line, right? The issues there are a little bit different. Um, but I think there's a way to structure the way we execute these processes so that they become um, kind of uh, frameworks for solving problems instead of uh, creating them. You know, one interesting point on that is that there's a few different ways to do some of these permitting processes. And sometimes the intuitive thing is to do the fastest one, but that's also um, creates litigation risk. Whereas if you're going to have a controversial project, you're actually better off acknowledging that it's controversial from the beginning and going through a somewhat more extensive process that inoculates you a bit more on the back end from litigation because of the nature of how um, how you document the process. So, you know, long long story short, uh, you know, be clear about what the obstacles are going to be. Be honest in the risk registers and how you you know are are candid about who likes it and who doesn't like it. You know, try and bring everybody to the table, whether or not they agree at the beginning. And um, you know, I think the more organized you are about troubleshooting um, one challenge after the other, the more it uh, gets to closure. And sometimes the projects that take long have fundamental problems. Mm. Sometimes they don't. Yeah. So Eden, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, climate change. And I have two questions. One is, does the muni bond market fully reflect the risks that climate change poses to some communities? And secondly, is there enough e ESG appetite to reward municipalities that are doing resilience projects with lower yields, or is it just more of a talking point? Um, it's a great question, and it's an area where I think, you know, I think it's somewhere in between, right? right. You, you know, I think that knowing how you appropriately model these risks is an area of practice that is not as mature as I think it will be 10 years from now, right? Whether that's the um, air, air pollution impacts that affect people who live in the neighborhood and breathe the air, or whether that's how likely your road is to wash out because of a flood or a mudslide or fire, you know, things that are unfortunately affecting places all over the country, depending on what your risks are. You know, here, it's more about rockfall and mudslides, um, right. due, you know, due to the mountain environment in Florida or, you know, even New York or Maryland, it's going to be more about the flood risk. Right. You know, I think those, those things, the risks to infrastructure are very real. And, you know, we're going to have to get better at being honest about what they are and the cost benefit of doing projects when they entail some of these risks. And frankly, knowing what we can control against and what we can't. Um, Eden, what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, David, can you repeat the first part of your question again? Because I just so want to try and answer is, it. Um, does the mini bond market fully take account of uh, the risks that climate change poses to some municipalities, the ones that are most vulnerable? And secondly, yeah. is there any does does the market reward? Does it, is there enough appetite for ESG? And is it is green well enough to find so that you get some benefit when you do a resiliency project or is it all just homogenous, you know, so, dollars and cents? So in terms of the first question, I think it's complicated because one thing I you had an earlier panel that talked about disclosure in the municipal market. I think the disclosure is really difficult. And I think there's been a lot of work in that area. I think there's a lot of new data that's come out. There's a lot of different sources, different vendors that are working towards get, getting, getting, getting better ESG disclosure. However, I don't think ESG is something new. I think this is something that the terminology is new. Talking about environmental, social, and governance is new terminology, but it's actually something that we've looked at for years and years. I've been doing this for 20 years. We have been asking governments forever about droughts, about floods, about wildfires. This is actually nothing new about, you know, conservation is not new. Um, it's just a new terminology to talk about environmental. Uh, social is not new. We've talked about demographics forever. That's been in our criteria forever. If you have a declining population, that affects your ability to have economic growth. Uh, so it's just a new term. Uh, governance is not new. We've talked about management forever. Management is a key rating factor and always has been for us since I started rating bonds. So I just think the terminology is new and it's become a very you know hot button item. But this is not, none of these factors are new. This has been in our criteria. We've looked at this since I became a rating analyst in 2001. Um, so uh, so I, I don't know if that answered your first question, I, but I do think it is something that we've always looked at. And I do think governments have focused on this. They, you know, I remember rating bonds in 2001 and talking to different places in North Carolina. They didn't have chief resiliency officers, but they had capital plans that dealt with floods or that dealt with 
different, is, in, different issues that they now deal with today that they might have a chief resiliency officer who is focusing on. Um, hmm. So uh, I, I do think, uh, what was the second question? So I can- Let's, hold, let's off, hold off on the second one, I'll come okay. back to okay. Brian, um, there's a question on the chat that uh, you hear a lot. I could answer it, but I'm gonna let you do it, which is, isn't spending all this money on infrastructure at a time when we have inflation just gonna make inflation worse? Well, again, this goes back to the structure of the bill. So the answer is no. One, um, and, and outside folks have definitely said, yeah, sure, of course, spending any bit of money right now may be inflationary, but th the impact of this bill uh, is, is uh, positive um, on the inflation issue for a couple of reasons. One is we actually are, are actually going to fix the supply chains that have created a lot of the, the situation that we have today in ports and rail um, and, and airports and railways increased the productive capacity of the economy um, with a lot of what we have. The second thing is we're actually just not spending that much money in this current fiscal, in this current year. Um, a lot of the money, as, as you know, said, goes in the out years. Um, and then there was actually a bunch of uh, programs that are actually designed to specifically lower costs for people in the immediate term, like the lower um, cost internet program or weatherization or energy efficiency, which um, ultimately we think is is uh, good on all those fronts. Hmm. So DJ, um, I public-private partnerships may be a phrase that's used at least as often as ESG. And I wonder, what does it actually mean in practice? So the federal government's gonna pump all this money in. Is this something where we're gonna see public-private partnerships or is the public money basically crowding out the private here? Um, I think it's a little bit more of the latter, to be honest with you. So public-private partnerships, for those who aren't familiar with it, in essence, it's a broad phrase that, that includes uh, a number of procurement methods whereby the public sector that owns, as David mentioned, you know, Infrastructure America is owned almost exclusively at the state and local level, where those state and local governments invite a private party in to accept more risk than a traditional procurement in exchange for the private party investing in that infrastructure and actually using private equity. Uh, very, very important to note that private equity is not free. You have to pay it back. Uh, there is a common misperception that uh, public-private partners will bring more funding into infrastructure. It actually doesn't bring more funding. It brings more financing tools so that states can accelerate these projects. At the end of the day, infrastructure funding comes from two sources, users and taxpayers, full stop. That's it. Um, so if you're using private equity, you have to pay it back from taxpayers or from users of the facility. I think it's going to be crowding out in two ways. Uh, first of all, as everyone has mentioned, you know, the, there's more funding, and, and Shoshana's point's dead on, which it's not this tidal wave and tsunami of funding, but it's you know 29% more in the highway area, transportation area, so significantly more funding available. So there's less need to look for financing alternatives than, than you might have otherwise. Um, and then secondly, crowding out in terms of time. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure Shoshana's team and, and other state DOTs and cities and counties across America are, are getting their teams to focus on how do we apply for federal funding and grants, as opposed to how do we think of new innovative ways to involve the private sector in funding these, this infrastructure. So there's probably two levels of crowding out. It'll still be an important tool. It applies really just to a relatively small subset of infrastructure projects. So um, it's, it's a great tool to have in the toolbox. It can be useful, but uh, in the current environment, given the amount of cash that's coming in and the need to hustle pretty aggressively for the competitive grant programs, it's unlikely we'll see a significant uptick in public private partnerships. Hmm. I see and you now. David, I just like to, yeah, before I ran the department, I was a state um, analyst and we include P3 debt as, as state debt. We don't, we don't consider it as a um, pass through. We do include the, the debt right. of the right. state. And do you agree with DJ on the appetite for that now, given the things he said? I do agree. Yeah. How much of a problem, Eden, do you think inflation is at the moment for these uh, infrastructure projects? I do. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Who are you asking? Well, you go first, DJ, and then and then Eden. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's enormous, and, and I think one of the my first drop in remarks that got going too long. I was going to talk about that a little bit, but. You know, three years of inflation at the current level pretty much wipes out all the benefits of increased IIJA funding. So uh, getting inflation under that, control. That's just, that's only true on roads and bridges. 
I mean, that's just not true. I don't want to cut. I mean, I just, the bill is much more than just this, the one sector of the, that we're talking about. That's exactly right. So FRA, Federal Railroad Exemption, has like a 486% increase. So yeah, no, no level inflation is going to wipe that out. But as I mentioned earlier, the vast bulk of spending is on transportation. And for the transportation part of the pie, um, that will be offset. In terms of like EVs, uh, grid spending, Amtrak spend, all these spendings are whole new big chunks of money. Uh, obviously, that won't be offset because it's, you know, the existing program, the programs that don't exist now. So it's all new, new funding. Right. Um, Eden, how, what do you think? Is inflation give investors concern about these projects or? I think it's, the concern is, is finding the workers. It's a big issue and getting and, and, and paying their wages. I think that's a huge issue right now is finding the workers and for the governments to, to get them done. So I think that's a big issue with the inflation right now. And Shoshana, how, how big an issue is that in Colorado for you? It's significant, but it's also uneven in different areas, even within the road and bridge discipline. Like trends that we've seen you know, kind of correlate to what logic would hold, right? You know, in areas that are more rural where the workforce is more sparse, you know, you're seeing more of the constraints due to supply of people to work on the project. You know, the commodities are not all the same and can fluctuate and, you know, also often are related to sort of the location of where production occurs, you know, so depending on how far you have to move materials, that can that can fluctuate as well. Hmm. You know, I think the other thing is that there is a need to kind of control for how much we let project costs run over because of the assumption of inflation. I mean, you know, we, we are getting non-trivial pressure from parts of the industry to, you know, approve of cost overages without doing diligence on them. We're not going to, right? I mean, making sure that each time you let that happen, you cross-check it and document it and, you know, identify also whether it's worth paying for the price of inflation right now. That conversation has to happen on every single project to make sure that even in a environment with inflation, we get the best return on taxpayer investments. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm beginning to think that now anytime you have any problem with any service provider, it's always there's a supply chain problem. It can Remarkable. Be you're getting your coffee at a restaurant. Oh, there's a supply chain problem. It's become the all purpose excuse. So uh, Ryan, we're almost out of time. So I wondered um, what what have we not addressed that you think is important for people in the community that we're, of people we've assembled for this conference to think about in terms of how you're implementing the IIJA, if anything. Look, I think the, I think Eden uh, just kind of hit, hit one of the points. I mean, there are two things that are kind of universal that come up in every conversation we have, whether it's a public sector agency at the federal government level, state or local government, uh, contracting community, private sector, and, and there are two, work, workforce, 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 and then, um, you know, local uh, technical capacity and just skill to be able to execute uh, federal contracting, particularly at the lo for low capacity communities, um, small towns, community, uh, rural uh, America, um, where we're really trying to make sure that these dollars reach the places that need it the most. Um, and, and there's a lot of that. So we're very focused on uh, a couple core uh, workforce pipelines um, in the broadband space, electricians for all the various components that go through uh, there and then, you know, the, the general construction and building trades is one where, um, you know, we just we have a, a, a declining workforce overall, and we have this huge increase in investment over the next uh, decade, and uh, we're all going to have to figure it out. This is not a federal government problem, or and there's not going to be a federal government solution. It's very regional. It's very uh, occupation specific, even smaller than sector specific. Um, and so we're, we're going to have to have really some local regionalized approaches uh, right. to move forward. So that I want to thank Eden, Shoshana, Ryan, and DJ for an uh, interesting conversation. And I want to thank everybody who participated in the conference overall. Uh, we are going to send around a survey monkey. We're interested in your advice on how we can do this better in the future, hopefully someday in person in the future, even though broadband seems to work at least for three out of four people on the call. Um, and with that, uh, thank you all. And on behalf of the Brandeis, Wash U, uh, and the Harris School at Chicago, I want to thank my colleagues at Brookings, Megan Waring, Hauen Chen, and Stephanie Sensula for helping us run this so smoothly. And we'll see you next year, if not before. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.